Seriously, the worst feeling for me is having a big stack of books, but also having a cold. So I have all this tempting literature, but I can't read it because I've got a head full of cotton. Hi friends, I'm Eric from Lonesome Reader, and here I was all smug thinking that I'd evaded all of the winter colds that everybody's been getting in London lately, uh, but then in February, I got not one, but two colds. So I, I came down with this cold and it was like really miserable and awful. And then I got over it, or I thought I got over it and I was still having a cough. And then I came down with another really bad cold, which I was laid down by. It just feels like it's going on and on forever. And like, this is happening to a lot of people, but uh, but yeah, it's it's really frustrating. I and mean, to be fair, the cold might have come back uh, because I took a weekend to go away to County Cork in Ireland with some friends. And we had a really great time, um, drank a lot, and like spent a lot of time uh, wandering out on the coastline, this like gorgeous, beautiful Irish coastline. We we went uh, on Ireland's only cable car to Dursey Island where we saw dolphins in the bay. It was so beautiful and magical, but it was freezing cold and we spent a lot of time outside. So um, yeah, that might have had something to do with it too. But yeah, you have to enjoy yourself while you still have time. So I did all that and that combined with like my new part-time job uh, meant that I didn't have as much time to read as I intended to, uh, but I still read some really good books, um, although it's like a mixed bag, a really interesting mixed bag books that I read in February. I'm afraid the first novel I read wasn't so great, and here I thought I was, like Mr. Always Positive about books, uh, but uh, yeah, this, this book I read, uh, The Melody by Jim Crace, and I was particularly disappointed by it because I've loved Jim Crace's novels so much in the past, um, like his his previous novel that he published before this a few years ago called Harvest uh, was brilliant and really haunting. And to be fair, there are some great things about this novel. Uh, it's sort of done in Jim Crace's trademark style where it's set in this place which is sort of recognizable reality but like not in any particular time or place. It's just in this, this place which feels very familiar but um, isn't actually real. Here he writes about a famous sinner um, living in a seaside town in this sort of old crumbling down mansion and whose uh, outside garbage bins are regularly looted by animals and homeless people in the night. And he has a disturbing encounter in his house with what appears to be a feral naked boy. The story that follows has a sort of nightmarish logic to it but it often like meanders a lot and doesn't seem to go much of anywhere. Like he seems to be writing a lot about our anxieties, our uh, like unspoken anxieties, and the way communities sort of shore themselves up against uh, these things that they fear. But in the end, this novel I didn't think was like hugely memorable, so I was really excited about this, but like left it feeling a bit disappointed. Then I read the most wonderful, sweeping historical novel, The Seal Woman's Gift by Sally Mugnison. I already talked about this novel in uh, my prize prediction video with Anna and how it made me weep like a baby. Seriously, the ending is so emotional and stories that are about people trapped between two different countries and two different lives, like those are the stories that always really get to me. And also it pressed all the right buttons for me because I really empathize with stories about people um, who are forced to leave uh, one country or one culture to live in another culture, um, whether they're, they're forced to do that or they, they must leave because of pressures within the society that they grew up in. So the story is about a group of pirates from uh, Morocco and Algeria who kidnap a large group of villagers from the coast of Iceland in the 1600s and they take them back to the Ottoman Empire where uh, they, these villagers become slaves. These people who had only known Iceland are suddenly living in the Mediterranean, so entirely different religion and culture and language and climate. And like when any people are forced to move from their homeland, they, each individual faces an impossible choice. I mean, even if they survive the ordeal of slavery and many of them perished, but each individual faces the, the choice of to maintain their Icelandic heritage and traditions uh, and hope that they'll be rescued or try to integrate into so the, the society of the Ottoman Empire. So this is a really epic story about 
politics and identity and love, and I just fell for it. So then I was really on a roll because I read another brilliant book, uh, which is Sight by Jesse Greengrass, and I don't need to go into why I think this book is so great, because uh, I made a whole video about why I think it'll win the Booker Prize this year. I don't know if I have anything more to add about this book that I haven't said already, but I just love it the more that I think about it, the way it taps into history as a way of understanding ourselves and our, our whole existence. I should say that this is a story about a woman grappling with ideas, um, specifically ideas about motherhood and the way of letting your child be in the world. It's not an action-packed story, but it is a meditative book, and I think it's really profound. So I went to a really great book event at Waterstones Gower Street, um, which was readings by debut authors, including Jesse Greengrass. And I don't think I had any embarrassing encounters with these authors. Uh, it was just really nice to say hello to Jessie. Um, I met her a uh, number of years ago when I interviewed her about her book of short stories. And we're not big friends or anything, we just occasionally chat to each other on Twitter, but I'm just so admiring of her talent and her intelligence. But a funny thing she said when uh, she was asked by audience members if she had any writing tips, and she said her, her only writing tip, the only writing tip she's ever had, and how she wrote this novel, um, how she went about writing it was she wanted to know how much she should write every day um, to, to realistically get this book done. So she actually Googled how many words should be in a novel, and the consensus is like around approximately like 60,000 words. So she just divided that by the amount of days that she wanted to take to write the novel um, to the deadline that she had. And um, then she had her word amount that she should complete every day, and then she, she did it. She just um, wrote those amount of words every day, and she finished the novel in the time that she wanted to. And she thought that this just gave you really a clear, like, practical goals um, to get through. So also at this reading were the next two authors um, whose books I read, who uh, are Emma Glass and Abby Andrews. So Emma Glass wrote this novel called Peach. It's a very slim little novel. Um, you, you'd like have to call it a novella. Uh, some people have already been discussing this novel already, uh, like the awesome Catherine at the Reader's Anthem on her YouTube channel. Uh, she made a whole video about 10 novels about feminism and womanhood, and she included in that uh, this novel Peach. Uh, so I'll link that below because it's a really interesting, great video. This is basically a novel about the mind of a girl uh, after sustaining a serious assault, uh, but it's told in a really absurdist and linguistically innovative way. It's been praised by George Saunders and Leilene Paul, who uh, wrote a great novel called The Bees uh, a number of years ago, which was shortlisted for the Bailey's Prize. Uh, actually, I have a really awkward encounter story with Leilene Paul, but I, I don't think I'll, t I'll talk about that now. But, um, but the quote that Leilene Paul gives um, is really apt. She, she describes it as sharing literary DNA with Gertrude Stein, Hubert Selby Jr., and Amor McBride, but Emma Glass's massive talent is all her own, and that, that really does sum up the style of this novel. She has characters who are given the, the names and characteristics of food or inanimate objects, like there's a character called Mr. Custard, and before Mr. Custard teaches his lesson, all the all the other students have to sort of like gather up his body and, his, and form him into a shape so that he can give his lesson because he's just like this sprawling blob of a man. So this is obviously intended to be comical from one perspective and uh, like I, I did sort of find it funny and, and it, but it did like remind me of the movie Sausage Party, if any of you saw that really silly movie um, about uh, items in a grocery store that come to life. But it could also like really be touching in this novel in some ways because uh, like uh, Peach's boyfriend is called Mr. Green and he has a lot of the characteristics of like a tree or a plant and he's often described as sort of like enclosing her and like really like protecting her and taking care of her in, in a way that, that is really moving. But then I felt really conflicted about this kind of style because this like anthropomorphic style, um, it, in a way it seems like it doesn't treat the 
the, the subject as seriously as maybe it should. But some parts are so startling and grotesque uh, that I'm sure Emma Glass takes it very seriously. But it is a really interesting way of looking at this, this girl's perspective because you could say that she's been forced by this traumatic experience to into having this childlike perspective of the world. So overall, I think it's really good and the fact that it's left me still puzzling and uncomfortable is probably a good thing. So the third author I saw at this debut fiction event was Abby Andrews who wrote this novel called The Word for Woman is Wilderness. This is about a young woman who loves reading about Thoreau and Chris McCandless uh, who was a young man that turned his back on society to go live in the Alaskan wilderness and then he sadly died um, accidentally and uh, this his story was sort of immortalized in the movie Into the Wild. She really notes how almost every story uh, about an adventurer or someone who's traveling into the wilderness to kind of discover themselves and understand society better, um, these are all male-driven narratives. And the experiences and challenges faced by a woman would be very different. So um, she, she writes about that, a woman um, taking on this challenge, a woman who's um, just left school and she, she leaves England. Um, the first part is about her traveling uh, across um, by sea and uh, by going through the, the tundra and hitchhiking across Canada um, to get to Alaska. And then the second part is about her living in the remote wilderness of Alaska all by herself. And it's told partly in a documentary style, like the her, um, her impetus for going is to make an actual documentary about it, so she has a camera with her. And there's these um, sort of script sections where she, she writes about these scenes of recording herself on camera or interviewing people along the way. She draws references and like taps into ideas from so many different things, like really interesting things like quantum mechanics and Cartesian philosophy and the, the whole space race during the Cold War and the, the Voyager probe which was sent out into space which gave us such a new perspective on different planets in our solar system and moons in our solar system and, and she talks about David Attenborough do documentaries and, and she, she can, tries to connect all these, these disparate ideas um, and concepts um, to, to form new ideas and, and it is done in a really interesting way but it's such a like sprawling look at, uh, and like trying to take into all these different things and so what reading this novel felt like to me was like um, staying up late at night with a university student um, who's really interesting and like sitting in a cafe and she's just telling me about all these different ideas and theories and trying to make them all cohere and fit into one thing and of course like they don't um, it's just like it's um, it's really interesting but uh, it doesn't it doesn't always like come together and so like as a novel I'm not sure if it really totally works. It all feels a little too much but like I think it's it's great and I'm like really sympathetic with it and I'm and I enjoyed reading it. It was really fascinating. I think it's important that there's a wilderness narrative told from a woman's perspective but just for me this felt a little too ambitious. Next I read a really edgy novel Felix Culpa by Jeremy Gavron and this is mostly composed of lines from other novels but like apparently the beginning of the novel um, the first few sections there they're mostly Jeremy Gavron's own writing but then there's several sections which are completely composed of lines from other novels and so all these lines are spaced out so you can like um, tell them uh, apart from each other that they're taken from different sources and so it's they're sort of spaced out kind of like poetry um, but it's it's um, formed into a narrative to make an entirely new story and it does read as like a, a novel, as a proper novel, where it's about a man, a, a teacher and a writer who enters a prison and discovers that there's this um, prisoner named Felix uh, who was released from the prison and then shortly died afterwards and there's a kind of question about um, why he died and how he died and so this writer goes to investigate that and like interviews a number of people and travels to, to places that Felix traveled to and it becomes this philosophical like inward search um, for like the meaning of life and people who disappear and whose lives are unaccounted for. So he draws from all these writing sources like Raymond Chandler and 
and George Orwell and Nadine Gordimer and Cormac McCarthy and Jean Genet. Uh, they're all listed in the back. Um, you can see all the writers that he included. Um, and I read a really interesting review of this book uh, by the writer Colin Barrett, who pointed out that all the sources he used are sort of literary novels. And so if you make a collage of all these different literary novels, what you're going to get is another kind of literary novel. And so it, it might have been more interesting if he drew from more obscure literary sources, um, things that we wouldn't really have expected um, to, to be meaningful and to make something meaningful out of like slightly less obvious sources. But personally, I loved this book, uh, both for its innovation and the story that it told. And then finally, I read the novel The Book of Joan by Lydia Yuknavich. And this is such a like wild story. Um, it's set in a dystopian future, but uh, quite near in the future. It's in the year 2049. Uh, but there's been a calamitous event on Earth um, which has quickly like led to the destru destruction of the planet and also um, the human species like mutating. And so these, these elite mutants survive in this sort of spacecraft above the planet Earth, um, uh, circling around the planet Earth and sucking out of this, um, it's, Earth is described as this dirt ball just sort of hovering in space. And uh, these survivors are sucking the, the last bit of nutrients and, um, and resources out of the planet Earth. And there's this character called Christina, um, a mutant living on this, this spacecraft, um, who is a tattoo artist and she tattoos lines of verse and poetry into her skin. And all of these mutant survivors, they sort of graft layer upon layer of skin on their bodies and she, she tattoos uh, this poetry and verse um, into her skin, uh, memorializing um, and canonizing this the figure of Joan, um, who was one of the people that led to the destruction of Earth. And so, yeah, it's a very strange story, and it it turns into this big conflict of sort of rebels um, versus this prevailing order that's in this spacecraft, um, which is overseen by this former self-help guru. And all of these mutant beings, they're sort of genderless because of their, their mutations. Um, everyone's genitals have fallen off or sealed up. And so uh, there, there is a lot in it about gender that's done in a really interesting way. Um, but like the, a lot of the times the stories, it felt like a bit too chaotic to me. Like, her really ambitious style of trying to, to build this whole alternative reality. Um, it, it felt like a bit too vague, so I, I just had trouble picturing it at some points. And when there was this, these massive scenes of conflict, um, I, I had real trouble picturing them. Um, but some of the characters were really fascinating. Like there's this one character who's Christina's best friend, and he's this, he's a, a homosexual and he, he uses a lot of like antiquated um, insults um, at that he, he lobs at Christina in a really affectionate way and that she takes in an affectionate way. And so a lot of the characters and ideas and, and the romance that occurs in this novel I found really effective. Uh, but like as a, as a whole, I don't know if it's gonna be totally memorable. Like I really enjoyed and was involved in the reading experience as I was having it. But then quite soon after, I, just like a few days afterward, I was already forgetting a lot of it. But I know other people who have really loved this novel and, and it's why I picked it up because of somebody's recommendation and why I bought it because of um, some strong recommendations. And I think she's a really talented and fascinating writer. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure that this novel totally worked for me. So that was my reading month in February. But I hope you're all doing well and keeping healthy so you can still read lots of books. And I hope I stay healthy after this because yeah, there's just no bigger frustration than not being able to read while you're sick. Uh, but I'll speak to you again soon. Thanks for watching everyone.